Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India the final lecture of the first week of great experiments in psychology. In the first week's lecture, we discussed about the history and genesis of psychology and uh, we spoke about the philosophers, we spoke about uh, the physiologists who had a role in developing psychology and we spoke about Wilhelm Wundt and his contributions to developing psychology as a new discipline. Today, we will talk beyond Wundt. So, and here we speak about uh, the other developments that were uh, being taken forth uh, in the different parts of the world. And here primarily we are going to speak about um, Titchener, that is Edward Bradford Titchener, he was Wundt's um, uh, student and he uh, propagated psychology in uh, America. He was an Englishman, he moved to England and uh, later on to America. And uh, of course, we see the role of two other very famous individuals, mainly Charles Darwin and Galton. So, uh, to start with our lecture, first I will introduce to an idea. Uh, it is actually an experiment that was being conducted in Cornell University in the 20th century, in the early 20th century. And this actually was about uh, swallowing a rubber tube. So, the students were asked to volunteer to swallow a rubber tube that would go down the stomach and then have hot water poured down the tube and again ice cold water poured down the tube. And all this was conducted for psychological research. So, uh, can you imagine any such experiment being conducted at that time uh, or even now as a part of psychological research? Yes, it was being done and this was being done by the uh, under the guidance of Edward Bradford Titchener in uh, the early 20th century and what he was trying to do was understand the processes uh, the in to understand the subjective experiences that an individual was going through when such an experiment was taking place. So, uh, strangely there were a lot of students who had uh, volunteered to be a part of this experiment. Imagine somebody swallowing a tube. So, there were several students who reported and it has been uh, doctrinated that there were several students who reported that they were having problems and uh, very soon, very often uh, they would vomit out the tube. But again, uh, they were uh, swallowing the tube and trying to conduct experiments. So, they would have to write down their perceptions uh, or their understanding their immediate experience when water was being poured through the tube. Similarly, other uh, experiments were also being conducted uh, like when an individual is uh, going to the lavatory, what were the experiences that he had, he was undergoing. And um, all these were done uh, by um, in a psychology lab where uh, led by Professor Titchener and he was trying to understand the form of introspection. So, Titchener uh, professed, Titchener as we have already spoken about several times was a student of Wundt and he uh, tried to uh, take Wundt's psychology to America. But uh, by the time he had uh, started practicing psychology and his experimentation in America, it developed uh, as his own science and he, though he spoke about it as Wundian psychology and he spoke about it as structuralism, it was very different from what Wundt had initially proposed. And he offered uh, this, um, he, he called this uh, psychology as I mentioned structuralism. And it attained a prominence in the United States and lasted for around two decades before it was overtaken by some other, overthrown by some other uh, dominant schools of psychology. 
So, Wundt had recognized that the how, how did Wundt and Tishner differ? So, Wundt had recognized the elements or contents of consciousness, but his overriding concern was their organization and that is where he spoke about the synthesis into higher level cognitive functions and here that is where he spoke about apperception or accumulating it or synthesizing it as a whole. Tichner on the other hand focused on mental elements or contents and their mechanical linking through the processes of association. So, he was more of an associationist. So, where he tried to link the elements in a process. So, uh, in a mental process and he discarded Wundt's theory of apperception, his doctrine of apperception and Tichner primarily concentrated on the elements themselves specifically. And in Tichner's view, psychology's fundamental task was to discover the nature of the elementary conscious experiences, to analyze consciousness and its component parts and thus determine its structure. So, how is, uh, so he was focusing on the conscious experience per se and what were the, to, an, to analyze that uh, consciousness, he used the uh, proposition of introspection and to divide it, uh, to break it into sub parts or sub components and determine its structure, that was his goal. So, Tichner, uh, to understand about Tichner, Tichner was an Englishman who was uh, interested, he was from Oxford and he became interested in Woundian psychology. But that was not at that point in time, as we discussed earlier, uh, England was not welcome to the idea of psychology and so he had to move to Germany, where these new sciences and these different ideas were being encouraged. So, he travelled to Leipzig to study under Wundt himself. Tichner earned his doctorate degree uh, in 1892 and he had very close associations with Wundt and his family and in fact, he had also travelled on a vacation with Wundt and his family. So, after completing his doctorate, Tichner returned to England and to promote experimental psychology, but it was not well received. So, he again took up a position in Cornell University in US uh, to teach psychology and direct the laboratory over there. He was just 25 years of age and he remained at Cornell for the rest of his life. He developed brain tumor and died at the age of 60 and till date his brain has been preserved in a glass jar on display at Cornell. It is a part of a collection in which began in 1889 and to study differences in brain characteristics. In fact, in one of APS uh, conventions, um, Tichner's brain was um, brought as a guest um, in, in one of the, yes, in one of the experimental psychology conventions. So, uh, Tichner uh, spoke of uh, conscious experience and he said that the subject matter of psychology is conscious experience as that experience is dependent upon the person who is actually experiencing it. This kind of experience he said it differs from the other sciences. So, um, say if a, if a physicist is trying to establish uh, the uh, any uh, fact, then he will need, he will not require to be present in that uh, room. So, uh, say for example, if you are trying to determine the temperature of a room, uh, an individual is not required, but in any psychological, to understand any psychological phenomena, the human being has to be present in that condition. So, physicist, he said, could examine the phenomena from the standpoint of physical processes, whereas psychologists had to consider the physical processes in terms of the human observation and experience, how human, how individuals, how human beings were trying to experience that phenomena. So, obviously, you would need an experiencing person, whereas the other sciences like physics and chemistry were did not require another individual to be present uh, or the human being to be present when you were making observations. So, uh, he uh, again uh, to repeat, he gave the example of uh, temperature in physics and he said that if the temperature in a room may be measured at 85 degrees Fahrenheit, whether or not anyone is in the room to experience it. But when observers are present in the room and report that they feel uncomfortably warm, however, that feeling or that experience of warmth is dependent on the experiencing individuals. 
that is the people in the room. To Titchener, this type of conscious experience was the only proper focus of psychological research. So, when we are talking of conscious experience, we are actually talking about the experience that the individual is going through at that point in time. So, imagine uh, uh, people talking about all this in the early 20th century. So, we actually see how advanced the thinking processes had gone. So, uh, they had the people were already talking of understanding doing experiments with human beings, people were already talking of um, conscious experience and what is important to understand human beings. So, uh, it is it's amazing to see how um, the psychology had established, had started establishing itself as a scientific discipline. So, um, in, so in studying conscious experience, Titchener warned against committing the stimulus error. Now, what is a stimulus error? So, it is confusing the mental processes under study with the stimulus or object being observed. So, here he spoke about the immediate and the immediate experience. So, for example, when you see an apple, when observers see an apple and then describe that object as an apple, instead of reporting the elements of color, brightness and shape they are experiencing, they commit the stimulus error. So, here you see we are actually talking like of moons uh, experiencing the uh, redness of the rose. So, it is quite similar. But there are some differences between Woodian and Titchener psychology. The object of our observation is not to be described in everyday language, but rather in terms of elementary conscious content of the experience. So, here he speaks like uh, as Wundt had already spoken of as immediate and immediate experience. And when uh, he says that when observers focus on the stimulus object instead of the conscious content, they fail to distinguish what they have learnt in the past from the object that they are currently seeing. So, uh, it as I was mentioning in the previous class, they uh, an individual who is uh, looking at an apple and saying, I was mentioning about the rose, but here also as an apple, if an individual says that this is a red apple or uh, this is a big apple. So, the moment you say it is a big apple, there are some ideas that you already have about your uh, the size of an apple. So, and that uh, by that previous experience, you are trying to estimate the current size. So, that is not an immediate experience, immediate conscious experience. So, uh, what they so here uh, Tishner says that observers, if they say about the size and shape and color and brightness of the object, then all the observers can really know about is um, you know, so they must be knowing about the past, uh, they have some past information that is guiding their current experience. But when they describe anything other than the brightness, color and spatial characteristics, they are actually interpreting the object, not observing it. And that is when an individual is supposed to commit the stimulus error. So, again to go back what is the stimulus error? It is confusing the mental processes under study with the stimulus or the object that is being observed. So, thus if the person is committing the stimulus error, they would be dealing with mediate and not immediate experience. Now, that brings us to another uh, idea that Tichner propagated or the idea of introspection. So, Wundt also spoke about introspection and Tichner, one of his students who propagated Wundt's view spoke about introspection. So, Tichner's form of introspection or self observation relied on observers who were rigorously trained to describe the elements of their conscious state and rather than reporting the observed or experienced stimulus by a fa familiar name. Tichner adopted Kulpe's label, another uh, psycho Kulpe was another psychologist of the time and he had started his study under uh, Wood. So, he was also a student of Wood and uh, Tichner took up uh, Kulpe's uh, label of systematic experimental introspection and he also used that to describe his experimental method of introspection. 
So, like Kulpe, Tishner also used detailed qualitative subjective reports of his subject's mental acts during the act of introspecting. So, mm, uh, it is a little different from Wundt. Wundt studied, Wundt said that you are studying the introspective process as it is happening and here Wundt focused on the objective processes. So, he focused on the objective quantitative measurements. Tishner on the other hand focused uh, on the parts, whereas Wundt focused, emphasized on the whole. And that is why he Wundt focused more on the apperceptive process. So, that is a synthesis of the elements. Tishner focused on parts. So, Tishner psychology or the stu study of structuralism is definitely very different from Wundt's study of the psychology. So, when we could uh, say that Wundt's study was more on voluntarism or he actually worked more on volition. The elements of consciousness, so Tichner spoke of the essential problems for psychology. So, he said these are should be the um, research areas of psychology. So, that is to reduce uh, to see uh, reduce conscious processes to their simplest, simplest components, determine the laws by which these elements of consciousness were associated and connect the elements with their physiological conditions. So, these were the three areas that Tishner believes should be taken up as psychological uh, mechanisms to be studied. So, uh, there have been several criticisms of structuralism and uh, struct it, but it has also made huge contributions to the science of psychology. One of the major uh, uh, reasons for structuralism's uh, build up in America was Tichner himself. He uh, was uh, an amazing orator and he his many of his students report his uh, lectures as dramatic performance. In fact, Boring, uh, one of his students uh, who later turned out, uh, Boring who turned out to be a historian later reports that his classrooms were overflowing with students and um, they were, uh, Tichner entered uh, through another gate and then uh, to that led him directly to the podium and his performance was uh, astounding. I mean his class uh, lecture, the way he spoke and here um, he was, uh, he, he looked and spoke like Wundt. So, there were many things that he tried to emulate from Wundt and many people actually thought, considered Tishner. In fact, he also uh, kept a beard like Wundt and many in uh, many people mistook him as a German. He was an Englishman, but he was mistaken as a German for by many. And um, Tichner's influence on his students was uh, humongous. In fact, um, several students, several of his students had objections to his, uh, to the way he uh, influenced their lives or he was involved in their lives. And um, so, perhaps uh, this way of um, uh, dealing with uh, his uh, students and with uh, psychology made uh, also helped in propagating his views, also helped his uh, and his personality, his oratory skills and the fear uh, and the, uh, the awe that it ar arose in um, you know arouse in many people in many of the students during that time. So, uh, there uh, the strange thing is that uh, most of the time students, uh, most of the times people uh, gain prominence in history because uh, they have objected to an already established view. Tichner on the other hand stood firm when others moved beyond. And there were other schools of psychology that were gradually coming up and, but Tichner stood firm and uh, with his idea and in this intellectual climate of America and Europe, the psychology of the time had also changed. But the published, uh, the establishment that Tichner had created, he did not move from his point. In fact, he was very angry with people who refuted his point. Mm, so, there, there were conflicts with people, but I, I must say that uh, Tichner's contribution to psychology uh, has uh, definitely led a, a, a groundbreaking uh, influence on development of psychology at that time. See, with 
uh, most of the theories coming up as a criticism to structuralism. So, um, this is uh, his research methods based were based on observation, experimentation and measurement and were in the highest traditions of science. And because consciousness could be only experienced perceived by the person having the conscious experience, he spoke about self observation. So, uh, the most uh, so and as the uh, way to study experience and he also changed the way uh, he tried to use uh, ex uh, introspection and in fact of course, Kulpe actually spoke about that uh, experimental introspection, where he speaks about more about the subjective report, where the individual um, explains what he went through after the conscious experience. And this is still followed, we will see that it is followed in other uh, places also. So, um, till date when you are doing a psychophysics experiment, especially psycho psychology students who are attending this course, you must be familiar with it. After an exper experiment on psychophysics, you are generally asked to report as a su your subjective experience of what you went through. The same thing is also used in space psychology, when people uh, experience the weightlessness. This idea was introduced by Wundt, but it was propagated also by Kulpe and finally, Titchener. So, these are still used till date. So, we cannot ignore the contribution of structuralism. Meanwhile, uh, in the other parts of the world, we see that there were certain developments that were taking place. And uh, one of the famous people of the time was Charles Darwin and his notion of evolution. And this changed the focus of the new psychology from the structure of consciousness to its functions. So, uh, see now psychology has est had established itself, there were people who were doing their uh, psychology programs, their doctoral degrees and were moving forth with their new ideas and with their new lab setups. And it was inevitable that this was a time for the functionalist to come. So, the functionalists primarily studied that what do these mental processes accomplish. So, now they did not uh, study the mental elements and structures, but they studied the mind from the functions and processes and how it related to the worldly experiences. So, it was obvious that the time was now ready for understanding the functions and this was primarily influenced by the other world developments and in this case, uh, Charles Darwin played a huge role and of course, also Francis Galton. So, uh, strangely they were cousins and Darwin in Darwin actually saw psychology as an important uh, science and he said that in the distant future, Darwin wrote in 1859, I see open fields for more important researches. Psychology will, will be based on a new foundation. And so Darwin's work influenced contemporary psychology in the following ways. So, he focused on animal psychology, which formed the basis of comparative psychology. So, as you see, psychology has established itself as an experimental uh, uh, science is also influencing the idea of comparative psychology or understanding animal behavior. So, uh, an emphasis also on the functions rather than the structure of consciousness, Darwin focused on that. The acceptance of methodology and data from many other fields. So, it was also trying to make psychology as an interdisciplinary science. So, we are talking about understanding data from other uh, sciences and a focus on the description and measurement of individual differences. So, the theory of evolution raised the intriguing possibility of continuity in the mental functioning between humans and the lower animals. If the human mind had evolved from more primitive minds, did it follow that there were similarities in mental functioning between animals and humans? So, this was the sunset of comparative psychology. We will see that the behavior is uh, who come later and who are experimenting on learning primarily had started with working with animals. And during this time, another uh, individual who happened to be Darwin's cousin uh, that is Francis Galton started talking about individual differences. 
Francis Galton was an, uh, an extremely intelligent person. It is considered that his IQ was beyond 200 and Galton had various interests. So, uh, he spoke about um, uh, he, he could speak several languages fluently and it is said that one of his professors asked him uh, to can translate uh, to translate a, pro a paper uh, an article from Dutch to English. So, he said that I in a week. So, he said that I do not know Dutch. So, his professor said that you learn it and he did. So, he was immensely intelligent and he had several ideas, he had um, different ideas that he would wish to pursue and if you can, uh, if you see, you will see that it is um, very uh, different, mm, they, they are very novel and very different from each other. So, a few of the topics he investigated are fingerprints, fashions. So, imagine him talking about fingerprints in the 1820s, uh, 1830s. The geographical, uh, he spoke about fashion, he was interested in studying fashion, the geographical distribution of beauty, weight lifting and the effectiveness of prayer. So, as you can understand it is way different, all his ideas are way different from each other. But what is very important in this that he was, uh, he read up uh, Darwin's book on evolutionary theory and he was so impressed that uh, there was an, he wrote a book on um, heritage, uh, inheritance and this he later used to um, this the book's name was Hedge Genius, which uh, again uh, Darwin read and thought that it was an amazing piece of work and it could be actually experimentally verified also uh, with the form of different experiments. Now, um, this uh, after this hereditary genius even from these various ideas that Galton had you will see that he, he thought that uh, there is a very important uh, effect of genetics on the way or hereditary on the way an individual presented. So, the individual differences he spoke about individual differences and he said that intelligence and different other traits were dependent on the inherited properties. So, it was less of the environment and more of the heredity. So, um, uh, the, so he uh, started working on mental tests and he uh, the Galton uh, so developed the idea of creating intelligence tests and he uh, mental test was the idea of mental test was actually coined by Cattle one of his uh, disciples and also a student of Wood. And um, what were mental tests? So, these were tests of motor skills and sensory abilities and uh, the intelligence tests are actually the same, but they are more a little more complex measures of mental ability. So, uh, the idea of these intelligence tests was originated by Galton and uh, Galton assumed that intelligence could be measured in terms of a person's sensory cap capacities and that higher the intelligence, the higher the level of sensory functioning. In fact, the information processing theories that were later developed also talk on similar lines. So, what did Galton do? To carry out his aim, Galton needed to invent the apparatus with which sensory measurements could be taken quickly and accurately from large number of people. So, he was trying to assess the intelligence. So, he would need to make sensory ex measurements and for that uh, to determine the highest frequency of sound that could be detected for example, he invented a whistle and which he tested on animals. So, he would move around the zoo and trying to test the behavior of animals when he tried when he used that whistle and this has come to be known as the Galton's whistle. So, most of you are uh, 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 you have familiar with this. So, um, Galton's whistle became a standard piece of psychology laboratory and used till the 30s after it was replaced by other things. So, other instruments that Galton used included a photometer. So, that uh, measures the precision with which a subject could match two spots of color, a calibrated pendulum to measure the speed of reaction to lights and sounds. So, this was actually uh, to see the reaction time and a series of weights that could be arranged in order of heaviness to measure the muscle sensitivity and the tactual sensitivity. So, you see 
Galton had actually started building a standardized laboratory, uh, psychology laboratory with uh, apparatus to understand the uh, mechanisms of the mind. So, uh, when we are talking about psychology as the study of the soul, the, from then you see it moved to the mind and then to consciousness and now we are measuring consciousness, Wundt spoke of it in one way, um, Tichner spoke of it in one way, Kulpe also uh, spoke of it in one way and now we are speaking about uh, the ways to measure the mind. So, and the ways to measure the functions of the mind through real time instruments. And he also Galton also provided a bar with variable distance scale to test the estimation of visual extension and a set of bottles containing various substances to test olfactory discrimination. So, see he is using all the, uh, the equipment to uh, understand the different sensory organs. So, uh, most of Galton's equipment have actually become a part of the standardized laboratory equipment of a psychology lab. So, he established the anthropometric laboratory in 1884 at the International Health Exhibition Center and later moved it to the London South Kensington Museum. And during the six years the laboratory remained active, Galton collected data for more than 9000 people. He arranged the instruments uh, for the anthropometric and psychometric uh, measurements on a long table and uh, where the recordings were done. So, this as you can see is Galton's laboratory. So, there were several of his assistants where the individual uh, entered from one room, one site and would continue. Uh, with all the experiments. So, this was the anthropometric laboratory to collect data on human psychometric capabilities. So, there were other measurements along with these sensory data that was collected and that was height, weight, breathing power, strength of pull and squeeze and quickness of blow, hearing, vision and color sense. So, prime actually each person took around 17 tests and Galton's purpose in this large scale test pro testing program was uh, to understand the range of human capacities of the entire British population to determine its collective mental resources. So, think about the time. So, this is the time when the world wars are on. So, here uh, this is the time when there is a lot of political movement in the world and Britain being an uh, taking an active part in it. At that point, it is also very important to understand the resources that a country has. So, Galton's uh, work on sensory, uh, on intelligence was um, well taken during that time. Strangely, you know, uh, Galton's data was taken uh, studied by psychologists in US uh, a century later and they found that the tests were statistically reliable and it provided the data not only provided information on all these tests, but it also provided information on the developmental trends of childhood, adolescence and maturity when the population was tested. And there were several things that showed that the rate of development during Galton's time had been slightly lower as in uh, in the measurements uh, in weight, arm span, breathing power, strength of squeeze. These uh, measurements that were taken by Galton a century ago, they showed that the uh, development was a little lower, uh, slower as compared to current times. Now, Galton during this time was also working on statistics and he is the first one to come up with the idea of correlation. So, uh, in fact, one of his students Pearson uh, was encouraged by Galton to come up with the Pearson's product moment coefficient of correlation later on. So, uh, Galton used these correlations also to understand the inheritance properties. So, um, he also influenced the um, idea of unconscious thought processes and um, which could be brought to the level of consciousness uh, through awareness incidents. And he wrote about this in an article in the brain in 1879. Sigmund Freud in Austria 
at that point in time was also working on his ideas of unconscious and he subscribed to this journal to understand to read Galton's work and he was really influenced by Galton's theory on unconsciousness. So, around us of great importance in Galton's results is also his understanding or, or his development of the word association test. Wundt um, at his uh, laboratory uh, adopted the technique limiting his subjective res the subjective responses to a single world. Later on Carl Jung another associate of Sigmund Freud took up the word association and used it in his ideas to develop his theory of personality. So, you can see Galton's wide influence on uh, different uh, psychological aspects. Again finally, Galton spoke about mental images. So, see Wundt uh, ignored uh, the use of imagery. And so, here he uh, Galton uh, studied in, uh, the in, in mental images and marked the first uh, extensive use of the psychological questionnaire. So, they were subjects were asked to recall a scene such as their breakfast table at morning and tried to elicit images. They were told to report whether the images were dim or clear, bright or dark, colored or dotted and black or white and so on. And strangely Galton saw that his first group of subjects those were his scientific acquaintances reported no clear images at all. So, some were not even sure what Galton was talking of. So, they were not being able to either develop the imagery or they were not being able to report it. Now, turning to a broader cross section. So, here he was uh, looking at other uh, uh, people uh, of the population. So, not the scientific acquaintances only and he obtained reports of clear and distinct images full of color and detail. And the best images were uh, given by women and children. So, they were more concrete and detailed. So, through statistical analysis Galton determined that mental imagery like so many other human characteristics is comes in a human uh, in a normal probability curve or a bell shaped curve. So, the average of the population will uh, be in the center, there will be some exceptionally good and some exceptionally bad. So, more than 150 years later two American psychologists repeated Galton's experiment comparing the mental imagery of scientists and college undergraduates. They found no differences between the two groups. The scientists displayed ample visual imagery in response to the same questions Galton had asked such as images of their breakfast table that morning. So, but uh, though the uh, difference uh, results uh, differences in results were seen it must still be acknowledged that uh, his work was the first study on mental imagery. So, Galton's work on imagery was rooted in his continuing attempt to demonstrate head three similarities. So, Galton spoke that people who uh, generally uh, from the same family uh, produce similar images. So, though at that time Galton spoke about it as heredity being heredity being an influence on the type of images the individual uh, reported, it could also be in today's uh, date with so much of information on psychology we can also say that it is probably also because of the um, amount of information and the, and the type of information that the family members exposed to a certain environment uh, are. Um, uh, uh, the input is available to an individual. So, maybe that is why uh, it is uh, it is the role of the environment which also has an, an importance as to how what kind of imagery is produced. But Galton of course, focused more on the hereditary uh, uh, effects uh, and its impact on uh, mental imagery and also on intelligence. So, finally, as we end uh, the first week's lecture in uh, great experiments in psychology, we have covered uh, the history and genesis of psychology as a science uh, from the developments uh, in philosophy and uh, physiology as well as the physical sciences and how its impact in uh, the world in different parts of the world. Uh, brought about this new science of psychology. How the geo, uh, geophysical, um, there are influences of Germany uh, being more, um, uh, more uh, substantially involved in the development 
of psychology as a science and then how it spread across to the different other parts of the world. And um, so, in the next uh, lecture uh, classes of the week, uh, so in the next week, we are going to take up classic studies in cognitive and social psychology. I hope you will enjoy it and uh, there will be a small assignment at the end of this week. So, please uh, it is going to be really small. So, please finish it and submit it as quickly as possible. Thank you.